Face it, shaker bottles suck. Your protein shake always comes out clumpy and you look like an idiot using the thing. That's why I decided to ditch my shaker bottle for good and get myself a Blendjet 2 portable blender. It makes perfectly blended protein shakes that come out smooth, creamy, and delicious in just 20 seconds. So go to blendjet.com and use promo code DCASTPOD at checkout to get 12% off your order. That's promo code DCASTPOD to get 12% off your order at checkout. Have you ever wanted to learn a new language, but just didn't have the time or money? I may have a solution for you. Her name is Jessica, and she gives free Chinese lessons daily at 11 p.m. Beijing time and 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Chinese is fun and easy if you have the right teacher. Let Jessica be that teacher and introduce yourself to the fastest growing language in the international job market today at tinyurl.com backslash tcjessica and tell her Ian sent you. Hello and welcome to the DeathCast, a place the cool, creepy kids come to learn about their true crime. I'm your host, author and journalist Ian Tott, and I'd like to thank you for joining me as we prepare to take our 11th look at the case of the West Memphis Three. Before we get into the case proper, as always, I have the normal show notes. If you'd like to follow the show on social media, just search for the DeathCast, DeathCast Pod, or DeathCast Podcast. You can find me on most social media platforms under one of those monikers. If you'd like to help the show, there's a couple ways you can do that. First and foremost, you can go to your favorite podcast app, subscribe, and leave a five-star review. Another way you can help the show is consider making a one-time donation at buymeacoffee.com backslash the deathcast. You can find that link in the show description. And lastly, if you are interested in becoming a longtime supporter of the show, such as our friends Channel and Anthony, you can go to the Patreon page, tinyurl.com backslash dcast Patreon. For as little as $2 a month, you can become a Patreon member and get access to exclusive content such as early shows ad-free as well as exclusive episodes. I'm currently in the process of working on the first of those right now. All right, now that all that's out of the way, get yourself something to drink. Find a nice comfy chair, kick back and relax. I've got my coffee, I've got my cigarettes. Let's go into the crypt. We left off last week. The defense team had just finishing Damian Eccles. And just in my opinion, they really didn't do a very good job of having Damian paint himself as someone who was not guilty. One little piece that I left out is that Damien actually got defensive on the stand when discussing what Wicca was and what the word meant. He called the current form of Wicca a quote-unquote bastardized form, which to the judge and jury, anytime you have a defendant who is on the stand that gets defensive, that does not look good. They start wondering why you're getting so defensive. And it makes them question as to whether or not you're being truthful or if you're actually being defensive about something because you are lying. Prosecution starts off by asking Damien if he's on any types of medication. He admits that he is, stating that this medication is in fact for depression. They ask him his girlfriend's name, to which he responds, Dominique Tear. For asking him whether or not the... Hollingsworth are in fact related to Dominique, that they'd be able to give a good description of her, as well as whether or not they would be able to give a good description of Damien. We're going to look at a piece of testimony here where they're discussing Narlene Hollingsworth. Quote, Question, and she knew that you David Dominique, correct? Answer, yes. Question, and you have heard her testify in this court under her oath that on the night she came off the service road, she flashed her bright lights, and there was you and Dominique T. right there on the service road down from the Blue Beacon. You heard her testimony. Answer. Yes, sir. Question. Do you know any reason why she would make up that story? A. Maybe she thought she did. Question. 
her son that was there, he is also, Anthony is also related to Domini, right? Answer, yes. Question, and he is also, have you seen him? Are you familiar with him? Answer, yes. Question, and he was also in the car and he was absolutely certain. You heard him testify that he saw you there that night. Answer, nods head. Question, correct? Answer, yes, sir. Question, do you recall what you did that night the fifth, before the 5th? Answer, I was either at my parents' house or Dominique's house. I think it was my parents' house because I had a doctor's appointment. Question, you have indicated that you have a problem with your memory as far as specific times. Answer, uh-huh. Question, your mother testified that when you were down at the police station, one of the things she told you was, we're, we've got some alibis, correct? Answer, yes. Question. She's testified that same day the police talked to you, or maybe it was your sister, that that is when you first started discussing among the family about the details of those alibis, correct? Answer. Yes, sir. Question. When the police talk with you on the 10th, at the, that point in time, you tell them from 3 to 5 p.m. is when you think you were at the Sanders. Is that correct? Answer. I probably told them that. Question. That was about five days after the boys had turned up missing that you told him it was around three to five? Answer, I probably told him that if it's in the report. Question, when your mom tells him something, it's about five or six or five to six thirty, okay? Answer, nods head. Question, as time moves on and the time period that is in question becomes later that evening, the visit to the Sanders house becomes later that evening, correct? Answer, yes sir. Question, so the story kind of changes to fit the facts we need to cover, right? Answer, yes, sir. Question, you have talked about, Mr. Price went on and on about this book with the upside-down cross as all the insignia and the trappings of satanic beliefs in this photograph of the person up on the altar with the ghost heads. Is that white magic type stuff? Answer, no, sir. Question, and you had this framed and hanging in your room, right? Answer, right. Question, you're pretty knowledgeable about that this stuff. You would not accidentally put some black magic picture on the wall, would you? Answer, no, the reason I had it on my wall is because it was a present. Question, who gave you that? Answer, Dina Holcomb. Question, after that you studied and looked into the satanic side of the occult, correct? Answer, uh-huh. Question, and you are familiar with it, right? Answer, I'm familiar with about every aspect of it. Question. You're familiar with a fellow named Alistair Crowley? Answer. I know who he is. Question. He is a guy who kindly professes he is a noted author in the field of satanic worship, right? Answer. I know who he is, but I have never saw any of his books personally. Question. Not much of a follower of his? Answer. I would have read them if I had saw them. Question. But Alistair Crowley is a guy that based on his writings believe in human sacrifice, doesn't he? Answer. He also believed he was God, so. Question. He also had writings that indicated that children were the best type of human sacrifice, right? Answer. Yes, sir. Question. But Aleister Crowley doesn't have any particular significance to you? Answer. I know who he is. I have read a little bit about him, but I have never read anything by him. They then go on to produce a document that Damien had written with people's names in a archaic language and one of the names that he had written was Alistair Crowley and it comes out through further questioning that Damien in fact wrote this particular piece of paper while Damien was sitting behind bars which he claims he was doing in an attempt to try and memorize these different types of alphabets. I will concede that Damien does you know, vehemently protest that he had never specifically studied Aleister Crowley, which is understandable, as I really can't see many libraries back in this period of time, especially in this area of the country, having books on Aleister Crowley specifically. Before they move on to asking Damien about being in the park, at the softball game, and Damien admits that he lied about being there two nights in a row before stating that the girls were not being truthful when they said that they had seen Damien multiple times. There's then a small objection 
from the defense team who's basically staying that it's an improper question as Damien isn't required to do anything. The state says that he's on the stand and he's stating that he has information that proves that the one of the witnesses lied. The judge says he's going to allow it, but not in that form. Continuing. Question, do you know why the Van Vickle girl would get up here and have any reason to fabricate a story under oath about you? Answer, there have been Damien sightings since I can remember. People were calling the police department saying they saw me marching around through Marion carrying black candles while I was all the way up on the other side of the country. Question, we aren't talking about a fake sighting. Answer, it is the same principle. It is a fake sighting. Question. You were there, right? Answer. The second night I was not. Question. But the first night is when she said you made the statement. You were there that night, right? Answer. Yes. Question. And your group was standing around you? Answer. Mm-hmm. Question. You had on the big black coat and long black hair? Answer. Mm-hmm. Question. And Jason was there? Mm-hmm. Question. She's right about all those things, correct? Answer. Mm-hmm. Question. You don't know why in the world she would get up here and under oath testify that you said those things? Answer. Little kids say that kind of stuff all the time to get attention. Question. Do you know any reason why the one who was a little older, the Medford girl, would say that? Answer. Probably because she mentioned something like to her mom or something and her mom carried it too far so she had no other choice than to get up here and talk about it. Question. I guess, Miss Medford, do you have any reason to know why she would get up here and give that testimony other oath? Answer, because her pro daughters probably did tell her that. So basically what they're saying at this point, they've just gotten Damien to state, is that he was at the park and that the girls probably did tell the mother that for that night. He was trying to play it off. They had told the mother these things because little kids say that thing, those types of things. I've never encountered a little kid who came out and said things like that, especially not ones who were, you know, 12 and 13 years old. They then move on to talking about various times. Damien also tells them that he can't remember what questions Ron Lax had asked him, claiming that his attorneys and Ron Lax had not gone over with him in any type of detail what witnesses were going to say when they were on the stand. Remember, Ron Lax latched on to this case and then told the judge that he was not charging the defense team, but he fully expected to be paid for it by the state. Damien then states that everything he has told them is true and that he and Jason did walk around Memphis. However, most of the time they walked around the Kroger area where Walmart is and that he had never walked in the area where the boys' bodies were found with Jason, but he had been over there when he was younger. He then describes how he gave himself a tattoo. Before moving on to question Damien about the knives, important thing on this is that Damien does state that he did have knives that he would carry around with him. However, he did not do this all the time. Quote, question, isn't it true that you are the one who told the officers that the children were mutilated? Answer, yes, I said that. Question, that was on May 10th of 93. The autopsy was done on May 7th. So we're talking about four days after the body were covered. Answer, mm-hmm. Question, said they were probably cut up one more than the others. Those are your words, aren't they? Answer, he asked me, was one cut up more than the others? I said, yes, they were probably. Question, you indicated that you had heard they were drowned? Answer, no, I indicated I heard they were mutilated. Question, so when he put down in his response to that question, heard that they drowned, he made that up too? That just isn't true? Answer, they made up a lot of stuff so far. Question. Answer my question. Answer. No, it's not true. Question. You never said that. The officer just put that in on his own? Answer. Yes, he did. Question. When he put that in there regarding whoever committed these crimes, probably thinks it's funny and that he won't get caught and won't care one way or the other if he did. Did you say that? Answer. Yes. 
Question. The officer didn't make that up, did he? Answer. No, I said that. Question. You told the officer was that you told him you thought the person who did it would think it was funny. Answer. Yes. Question. And would you not and would not care one way or the other if he got caught? Answer. Probably not. Question. Mr. Price has asked you about your feelings about being arrested. You said you had good days and bad days. Was it a bad day the day after you were arrested when you blew a kiss to the victim's family? Was that a bad day when you did that? Answer. That was one of the times I lost my temper. What they're doing here is they're painting Damien in a bad light as possible by showing him to be a callous, uncaring individual towards the victims and their families. Again, as I stated in earlier episodes, Damien Eccles really hung himself as much as Jesse Miss Kelly did, and as you can see from this testimony as it goes on, it's just getting worse and worse for him. Continuing on. Question. You lost your temper is why you blew a kiss to the victim's families? Answer. Yes. Question. And you did make the statement to the officer that I will tell you all about it if you let me talk to my mother? Answer. I said I will tell you everything I know. Question. If he says in his report that you said I will tell you all about it if you let me talk to my mother, that's inaccurate too? Answer. That's another of his lies. Question. And it is your testimony that you are just interested in Wiccan religion and nothing involving the black witchcraft or satanic practices? Answer, I'm interested in it. I read it, but I don't practice it. Question, these books where you have handwritten things and certain symbols on the books and your references that you made to Aleister Crowley, the person that is a supporter of human sacrifice, that writing that you made while in jail out here, that is all just a result of your interest in black magic, not that you practice it? Answer, that and being bored. Question, do you have any satanic incantations out here while you were bored? Answer, no, I do not. Question, and LaVey, the person that you indicated to the officers that was one of the persons you read a lot, that is not Wiccan white magic, is it? Answer, no. For those of you not aware, Anton LaVey was the founder of the Church of Satan out in San Francisco back in 1966, I believe it was. And he wrote a number of books, among them the Satanic Bible, a book on spells, and a few others before moving on to the Hollingsworths where the prosecutor asks Damien why the Hollingsworth would say that. Damien states that he's had a few arguments with them in the past that they were all very familiar with each other and for some of you wondering why they're questioning him in this manner thinking you know that it's not right they're jumping back and forth with this questioning like this this is a tactic of lawyers this is how they operate in court it's just like with the police. They jump back and forth and they'll come back to something that you talked about three or four minutes ago in an effort to try and get you to perjure yourself on the stand because if they can get you to perjure yourself on the stand, then all of your testimony is pretty much null and void and you've really hung yourself in the eyes of the jury because if you're lying about that, how, how can they believe anything that you have said prior to that? This is why lawyers will coach their clients before putting them on the stand in an effort to ha really hammer them with questions so they don't get ruffled while telling their side of things. Damien then claims that he doesn't remember anything that happened the day before or the day after. They then discuss the fact that Damien had written his son's name down on one of the documents that he had written while in jail in the archaic language. And then the defense team objects and they approach the bench. Because the prosecution wanted to introduce something into the evidence at trial that the defense team claimed they had not yet seen. This piece of evidence apparently came from Damien when he was in jail and was actually a photocopy, which the defense objects to being entered into evidence. The judge says that no, it can be entered into evidence. The defense tries to ask for a mistrial. The judge denies that. 
Eventually, the judge sustains the objection, meaning that this new piece of evidence cannot be entered into court. The defense wants to have a hearing to find out who gave the prosecution this piece of evidence. Then the defense goes on about violation of their client's rights, and eventually the judge says that he's not going to allow the evidence, but he will allow the testimony to stand, and he's going to call court until 9.30 the next day, which was March 10th of 1994. They have another brief meeting at the bench, wherein the state admits that they were wrong to have done so. Eventually, the judge tells the jury that the evidence that was introduced the prior days only to be considered in relation to Damien Eccles going back into his cross-examination. They show a map which shows 14th Street and Damien is asked whether or not he's ever been there and Damien states that given the location he would had to have been through there. Damien admits to having probably been in that area about twice a week over the last two years, stating that he had to walk through that area in order to get to Jason's house from where he lives. He states that he lived over at the Broadway trailer park. Damien shows them on the map where exactly it was that he lived. He also states that there were other people in Lake Shore that he was friends with who he would see. Damien is asked if he was a member of a white witch group, to which he says no. Further pressed on it, Damien states that he told the officers that he was a white witch and had been one for roughly five years, but not that he was a part of any organization. He's pressed on it further. Damien states again, I've never been a member of a group. Damien says that the officer made that particular piece of information up. They then discuss Damien's medication. Damien states that he is a manic depressive. He's asked to describe the difference between a depressive state and a manic state. They then have a conference at the bench over the admissibility of Damien's different types of moods when he is under this medication. The court rules that he can't ask this question because it's relevant to the case at hand. And the court warns the prosecutor not to go into specific uh, acts of conduct. Question, Mr. Eccles, when you have these mood swings and your medication is out of balance, do you have, do you get violent sometimes? Answer, only towards myself. Question, so you are telling us that these mood swings that occur, you don't get violent toward other people? Answer, it just makes me suicidal. Question, so your acts of violence towards other people have been the result not of any medication, but just, just out of anger? Answer, my medication doesn't affect how I deal with other people. Question, the incident in Oregon, you had an altercation with your father out there, is why you came back before they did right? Again, there is an objection as the defense does not want this particular incident discussed. Judge allows it. Damien is asked if he came back before his parents did. He agrees that this is true. Damien states that he came back because he was homesick, and the court asks Damien whether or not he'd had an altercation with the, his father. Damien states that this happened, and that it ended up that the police were called further stating that he had the police called on him because he was locking himself in his room and was about to commit suicide. Again, this is different from the stories that have come out in the years since the trial took place. And I'm hoping you're seeing that Damien likes to change the story the further he gets away from the actual events in order to paint himself in a much better picture. Damien admits that he was in the room, had knives, and states that his medication wasn't out of whack, but he had been drinking. He states his family told him to give him the knives, that he gave them to him, that the police did not take them into custody, and that he then was shipped back to Arkansas after his stay in the hospital. They then turn to the questions posed to Damien by Officer Ridge. When asked about the person who did this, 
The court contends that Damien told the police that it was someone who was either sick or a Satanist, and Damien states that that is not what was asked of him and that was not his response. He states that Rich said to him that the person who did this was either sick or a Satanist. Is that correct? To which Damien states that he replied that could be the case. Next, they move on to question number nine. Quote, okay, now on question number nine, when he asked you who, how you think they died, and the answer is mutilation, cut up all three, heard they were in the water drowning, cut up one more than the others, is that again what Officer Ridge said and you just agreed? Answer, no, I had saw that on TV, newspapers, people talking. Question, and you knew about the drowning, correct? Answer, I knew they were in the water. I didn't know that they drowned. Question, you knew that one was cut up more than the others? Answer, whenever they were asking me about mutilation, I thought different from mutilation. What I call mutilation was different from what I've seen up here. Question, I was asking about one being cut up more than the others. Answer, he asked me, was it possible? He said, do you think one was hurt worse than the others? I said, yeah, I guess. Question. So again, that particular area was one of those things where Officer Ridge told you and that wasn't your response. You just responded about the drowning and mutilation. A answer. If he didn't get the answer he liked, he would go back and try and get me to say something else. Question. And it is your testimony specifically that you weren't the one who said one was cut up more than the others? Answer. No, I did not. Question. That was Officer Ridge that said that? Answer, I agreed with him when he said that. Oh, question, okay, but the other parts of that answer were your words, not Mr. Ridge's. Answer, inaudible. Damien's then asked about question 11, which is how do you think the person feels, and Damien states that he thinks the person probably feels good and has power, before further stating that he gave an answer that to him was common sense. He's asked if the statement, give him power, means magic. Damien says, no, that's not what he meant. Elaborating, quote, they probably thought, well, that they were like overcovering other humans or something. Damien is then asked about question 19, about whether or not he had ever thought about killing somebody else, and Damien's response had been, gosh, I never thought about killing anybody. Damien is questioned about this and says that he doesn't remember what it was that he told the officers. There's an objection as it's not Damien's handwriting and the prosecutors can't make out what is said on the actual paper. They then move on to further questioning and Damien states that whatever is done to you comes back threefold, be it good or bad. Asked about the answer Damien game as to why the person would do this, Damien stated that it was a thrill kill and or a satanic act. Before turning to the fact that, according to Ridge, Damien stated that the number three was a powerful number in magic, Damien states that he was wondering why Ridge, while questioning him, kept banging up the number three and questioning about him about having three earrings and why it was a big deal. Quote, I wondered what three had to do with it because he made a big deal out of me wearing three earrings and anything with the number three he was making a big deal out of. I didn't understand that. Question, so that wasn't your response? You were saying that Officer Ridge made that up and you just went along with it? Answer, I agree with him so he would leave me alone. Question, but the significance of the three victims and that sort of thing. Mr. Ridge back on May 10th was the one who made that connection? Answer, right. Question, and that, did you also tell him that each person had a demonic side to him? Answer, I believe every person has a good side and a bad side, yes. Damien says he doesn't know who... It was that came up with the demonic side phraseology. But it's pretty apparent from his previous testimony that we've already gone over that any time he is presented with something that Damien now realizes that going to get his ass in trouble, he didn't say those things. Those were Ridge's words, and Ridge just put his name to them. He admits to saying that the younger the victim, the more innocent and the more power that they would give the person during the kill killing. 
And that's when the prosecution moves in and tells Damien that that sounds kind of like something that Aleister Crowley would say, to which Damien agrees. Damien then says that this stuff is things he's gotten from movies and tele- and books. Damien also says that when Ridge asked him, was it possible that the killer knew the victims and asked them to meet them in the woods, he stated, yes, it was possible. Before the state hits him with, so what the officer's saying is a lie and you're telling the truth, Damien's response is, quote, I wouldn't put him past him. Before being asked if he told the officer that the victims would be small unintelligent and easy to control. Damien admits to having made this statement and he's asked why he made this statement and Damien says that he figures that's the reason why these victims were chosen. He's then presented with a statement that he's supposed to have made wherein he told the officer that the killer would not have worried about the victims screaming because it was near an innocent interstate and Damien's response is that he wouldn't be worried because the victims were in the woods. Then he's asked if he told Officer Ridge whether that the killer would probably enjoy wanting to hear the victim's screams to which Damien said, quote, if he got off on killing people, he probably would like to hear them scream. And the prosecutor then says to him, those were Officer Ridge's words, and Damien agrees. Question, and is that also part of the common sense that whoever kills eight-year-olds can feel good and whoever kills eight-year-olds would like to hear them scream? Is that part of your common sense philosophy? Answer, I figured they must have if they did it. Question, you told him that the person was probably someone local, didn't you? Answer, "Uh uh-huh question that they probably wouldn't try to leave town correct answer correct question now we also asked you about what books you like to read didn't he answer "Uh uh-huh question you told him one you told him stephen king right answer "Uh uh-huh question he wrote that down answer "Uh uh-huh question you told him anton levey correct answer he asked i hadn't read anything by him but i know who he is then they discuss how Stephen King's name came into it. Damien says that it was because there were books of his in his room. You can see that the prosecution is really doing an admirable job of painting Damien as someone who backtracks on the things that they are purported to have said in order to make the other individual look guilty of having said these things, i.e. he's a liar. But then they get into the satanic aspect of it. And Damien tells the prosecutors that he told Ridge that were it a satanic killing, these are the things that would most likely be found at the crime scene. He's asked whether or not he said one of those things was candles, to Dam- which Damien said correct. And then he's asked whether or not he heard the testimony where uh, someone from the state crime ra- lab stated that there was candle wax present on one of the shirts. Damien agrees with him on that. Before stating that what was found and what he told the police was consistent with what was found on the scene. Damien then admits that that would be redolent of a satanic murder before they move on to the fact that Damien wore his trench coat with him everywhere. Damien states that even when it's hot out, he likes to wear the trench coat because it's part of his liking to wear black. I can't fault him for that one. I was very similar to that. They talk about where Damien's trench coat was found. Damien states that the trench coat was found on the floor near the closet in his sister's bedroom where his clothing comes from. And then the prosecution goes back to asking him about the candle wax. Damien says, quote, it could have been whoever killed him did it. He could have got it before he left home. I don't know. At which point they pass back to the defense for re-examination. The defense starts by having Damien read the headline from the commercial appeal on May 7th, 1993. The headline is, Mutilated Bodies of Three Boys Found in Bayou. Damien is asked to read a part from the article. The 
prosecution objects, and then they bicker about whether or not Damien should be allowed to read these. Eventually, it is sustained. He is asked to read the article. Damien reads the part. Quote, autopsy showed three boys died of multiple blows to the head. The West Memphis boys found dead Thursday in a slow-moving creek were killed by multiple head blows, police lead investigator said Friday. Question. Okay, the state asked you earlier about an incident with some kind of a fight or something that you got into with a gentleman you were trying to claw his eyes at or something. Do you remember that particular incident? Answer. Yes, I do. Question. Do you remember when that occurred? Answer. I am not sure what year or month or anything it was, but I think it was when I was in ninth grade. Question, okay, tell the jury who was involved in that and the background of that. The prosecution then objects, as the defense had earlier objected to the prosecution, asking about specifics of the assault that took place and any of Damien's other violent crimes. And eventually the defense realizes that they should not have gone down that road and asks that that particular line of questioning be pulled back and they do not wish to pursue it further, at which point the defense rests on questioning Damien Eccles. It is then the prosecution's turn to question Eccles yet again, and they go over the newspaper articles and they point out to him that it doesn't really say in there anything about the boys being mutilated beyond the headline, specifically one of the boys being mutilated worse than the others. Damien agrees with him that this is, in fact, the case, at which point the prosecution rests on questioning Damien Eccles and the defense declines to question him further. I have to believe that at this point the defense realized that Damien had cut his own throat, so to speak, because they did not have any follow-up questions for them over this such as, okay, you didn't know this from the newspaper, where did you learn it? They can then harass the court to give them a delay in the proceedings so that they can try and get discovery to see if, in fact, this does exist. Court probably would not have granted it, however, as the trial was already ongoing. Miss Kelly did not testify at the trial, which shows some semblance of intelligence on his defense team's part and that they were able to convince him not to testify at trial. That being said, the trial began on February 28th, 1994 and ended on March 15th with jury deliberation beginning on the 17th. It came out later that the jury saw Damien Eccles as having someone with, quote, something to gain, dishonest, manipulative, weird, satanic follower, Anton LaVey, Aleister Crowley, fiber match, incriminating testimony, ridge too close to facts, blue kisses to parents, traveled to crime scene 200 times, two years, lied, carried knives, Secondary confession, ball field girls, lied during testimony, imp inappropriate thought patterns, no credible witness, eat father alive, and wax on book shirt mention. For pluses, they put that he was intelligent, manic depressive, stuck to story, and had a loyal family. Baldwin's negatives were listed as Damien's best friend, jailhouse confession, low self-esteem, fiber match, knife, and frequented crime scene while... His pluses included in school, stuck to story, and exhibited remorse. We didn't touch on the supposed jailhouse confession that Jason Baldwin is said to have given. Uh, I'm not really going to touch on it because I personally don't believe that that actually happened. I think more likely than not, it was a case of an individual who was looking to make a deal with prosecutors and because of this came forward to the police with information that probably wasn't true. Eccles and Baldwin were both found guilty of capital murders. 
it was during the penalty phase that Exhibit 500 came to be, which is really everything about Eccles' mental health struggles. Compiled by Inquisitor Inc., which was a investigative firm owned by Ron Lax, when the penalty phase ended, the jurors began deliberating on what the penalties should be. This was on March 19th, and they took over two hours to reach their conclusion. Eccles was sentenced to death as he was seen as the ringleader and mastermind behind these crimes, while Jason Baldwin was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Obviously, they appealed this, but on 44 points of appeal, these convictions were confirmed. Now, we need to discuss what comes next. We are going to talk about the next 20 years, but we're not going to be spending as much time on it as I have on everything leading up to and including the crimes as well as the trials. People have a mindset that they remember when these crimes happened because they were national news. They were not national news. I remember because I watched the news religiously during this period of time and in fact during most of my high school years for just this type of thing because I found it fascinating. You would see blurbs here and there about crimes such as this in newspapers. Every now and again you would get something having to do with a crime like this on the national news, but I can promise you that the West Memphis Three never made national news on New York television stations out of New York City, which is where we got our news from. Because the crime was not big enough, it was not sensational enough, and there just wasn't enough public interest in this case for them to bother picking it up. That changed, though, because of the documentary Paradise Lost by Joe Berlinger and Bruce Sinofsky. Some people believe that the film was, you know, truthful. Myself and hopefully some of you out there who have been listening to this series are seeing things in a somewhat different manner. As I stated much earlier in the series, after seeing this film, I was firmly convinced, based upon the manipulative techniques of these two filmmakers, that the three young men who had been convicted of these crimes were absolutely innocent. And that is the feeling that many walked away with after the film premiered on HBO in 1996. Now, for... Something like this film to be objectionable, I understand it. There's no way you could fit everything into, you know, a two-hour movie. Uh, you can tell by the fact that we are on our 11th episode that you can't fit all of that in there. But they didn't even attempt to present any of the state side of things, i.e. the fact that the state had circumstantial evidence against Damien Eccles, such as fibers matching statements from him, wax on the shirts, a possible semen stain, things of that nature. Instead, they chose to portray the three young men as innocents who were targeted by a corrupt system who simply wanted to persecute these three in an order to clear this horrific crime from their books. That is not journalism. Neither is what you see on TV. Journalism is objective. If you've listened to this show for any length of time, or you have just discovered it because of this series, I make great pains to point out when what I am stating is my opinion. It's my opinion. 
opinion that the three men who were convicted of these crimes are in fact guilty versus what is fact. That is what journalism is. Journalism is giving you the facts without a spin on it in order to let the reader or the viewer make their own decision and their own conclusion on a particular subject. And I'm going to give you further examples of what does not constitute journalism. What I do here is journalism mixed with opinion pieces. Because I cover these cases, for the most part, from start to finish to the best of my possible ability with all the available resources at my command. And I inform you during the course of these, whether I'm giving you my opinion and when I'm giving you fact. The testimony I gave you of Damien Eccles was fact. He said those things, those questions were asked of him. If you look at, I don't know, the Gilgo Beach slangs, many people have opinions on that. I gave my opinions on that case while I was covering it. When I covered Rex Harriman, however, I covered every single aspect of the affidavit that was released concerning him and the reasons why he was arrested. And I went to great pains to state that he was innocent until proven guilty because that is how our courts work. There are other individuals who I am not going to name who profess themselves to be experts in crime, particularly violent crime and serial crime, and I know this because I know these people personally, who have gone on national television and, as opposed to stating facts, have gone out of their way to offer hyperbole because by offering these ideas that have no basis in fact or reality and stating them as fact, that guarantees that they're going to get more viewers. And if they get more viewers, they're going to be asked back on these nationally syndicated television shows with these harpy bitch hosts who are everything that is wrong in true crime. And when these individuals have these remarks pointed out to them after going on social media and jumping up and down, stating that, see, see, I told you this was going to, I told you, I said it on this show, I said this was going to happen, I said, I told you, and then it's proven that they're completely and utterly wrong. They don't say a word, because degree or not, they are not an expert. They are a lay person who works out in the field, but not in the field. And what I mean by that, unless you are working actively as a lawyer, or you have worked actively as a lawyer, unless you work actively as a police officer, a private investigator, or have worked at those things, you are not one of them. It doesn't matter what degree it is that you have. You are not an expert on these things. If you do not work in that field, out in the field doing this type of work on a daily basis. You may be an expert when it comes to book knowledge, but that does not make you an expert when it comes to field knowledge, which is why I detest those individuals, because they are quasi-professionals trying to amplify themselves and their voices by stating things that are in fact not true and have not ever been proven to be true in an effort to make themselves appear bigger than they actually are. And the public laps all of this stuff up because everybody has become a quote-unquote expert thanks to shows like CSI and Mindhunter and books by those individuals who are involved with those things in the real world, unless you're doing it for a living, you're not an expert. As I stated, I'm not an expert. I'm a journalist. I cover the cases. I try and present every single aspect of a case that is worth being presented, and I do put my opinion in there, but I let you know it's my opinion. That's not what we had with the West Memphis 3 case, however, 
we had a very slanted story on what took place and what, how the filmmakers believed that the case actually happened as opposed to presenting the facts and allowing people to make their own minds up about it. And because of this film and the hype surrounding it, the three men who were convicted of these crimes were able to get support from the public. Unfortunately, it was an uninformed public who only knows what the talking heads tell them, and I'm talking directly at specific people within the West Memphis Three movement who came out from Hollywood and from California in general in order to rally the troops behind these three falsely convicted boys. See right there, that's opinion. These individuals raised funds for the killers, got newspaper articles printed about them, had billboards put up all around the area asking for help in an effort to try and get these three men exonerated. And in doing so, they also attracted the attention of Hollywood bigwigs such as Eddie Vedder and Johnny Depp and the guy that did the Lord of the Rings trilogy and numerous others. Because of this, these three men who, in my opinion, were rightfully convicted, ended up having millions upon millions of dollars poured into their defense fund. But I should point out that even with all of this going on, the story largely did not make it onto a national stage after the initial shock of the film wore off. And if you haven't seen the film, I do encourage you to go and watch it because it's an important piece of documentation of this case. But I do have to warn you, the opening scenes are some of the most graphic things that you will ever witness and they will disturb you. The reason that I say that you should go and see it, though, is you can see how this affected the parents. You can see interviews with the parents where they are raw-boned and honest, but armed with the knowledge that the filmmakers intentionally put a spin on the story that they were telling. You can see the spin that, that was put on this case through the words and actions and parts of the trial that they decided to show within this film. Now, they followed this up in 2000 with Paradise Lost Revelations, which was right around about the time that I started not believing the story that was being put out there. I remember watching it, and if you haven't seen it, the entire synopsis of it breaks down in this. They're looking for another killer because these three young men are not responsible. They can't be responsible. They've been railroaded by a, you know, religious Bible Belt community, hell-bent on holding individuals with re beliefs different from their own accountable for crimes that they did not commit. So the entire focus of this film is John Mark Byers, and a knife that he gave to producers during production of the first film. Why John Mark Byers gave these men this knife, I do not know, but he did it. It should be pointed out, though, that it was not a large knife. It was a pocket knife, and it was found to have some blood on it that could have belonged to either John Mark Byers or his son. So that's what they focused on in this film. John Mark Byers as the possible alternative suspect, and they went so far as to pay John Mark Byers and to encourage him to go out and use drugs and alcohol before they began filming, at which point there's a scene of him in the woods. He's obviously fucked up, screaming for his son and demanding answers and justice and burning stuff, and it's all very dramatic. And the first time I saw this, I said, some shit ain't right here. There's no way that this guy of his own volition went out into the woods and did this without some coercion from somebody else. And I later learned that it was, in fact, at the behest of the filmmakers because John Mark Byers 
I don't know how any other way to put it. He was not a massively intelligent man, and he did not understand what these two guys from frickin' Hollywood were trying to do, that they are trying to manipulate him to paint himself in the worst picture possible in order to make these other three men look bad. They transported him to various hearings, wired for sound, and had him confront West Memphis Three supporters, basically making him look like a lunatic. They also began presenting a false evidence story that the knife wounds to the boys did not in fact come from a knife, but were either caused by a animal, snapping turtles, which you heard me talk about in other episodes, or that John Mark Byers, who had had his teeth pulled and replaced with dentures since the time of the killings, had actually bitten the boys, and that was his teeth that had done it. They tried to present it that John Mark Byers had done this because he knew that they'd be able to match the bite marks to him. Newsflash, bite marks have been found to be unreliable in court, and almost any time they are presented in court at this time, they are seen as being the same thing as a polygraph examination. They have no basis in court and are thus not allowed to be entered into evidence. So that piece of the fabric for their story goes right out the window with that. Never mind the fact that John Mark Byers was a drug user who never took care of his teeth, which is the reason why he had to have his teeth removed. Eventually, Byers begins to realize what they're doing to him during the filming of this and agrees to take another polygraph test, which, surprise, surprise, he passes. Again, though, interest of fairness, I think polygraphs are bullshit. They also talk about the Mr. Boat Jangles, which is the... African-American man who was seen in a bathroom covered in blood with a broken arm. And really, that's how they end the film with, you know, these linger questions of who really did it. And that's one of the tricks that the filmmakers and subsequent supporters have used is to only present one side of the facts or present a skewed version of the facts as opposed to presenting them as a whole and letting the individual themselves decide. And we're going to talk more about this in the next episode where we discuss the third film and everything that has happened since then, which will probably be the last episode on the West Memphis Three. Again, I'm not going to dive down the deep rabbit hole on all of the twists and turns concerning this case because I've presented to you the facts as they were originally presented in open court. I'm going to touch on the other side's story so that at the very least you have an idea of why they are saying that this is a case of misjustice, the things that they say are wrong with the trial, that kind of thing. And I'm not ashamed to say it. Yeah, I am going to blast these MFers because so many of them have come after me since I started this series, throwing quote-unquote facts at me that do not exist anywhere beyond the author's own delusional minds. And if you want to hear me pontificate more about that, I suggest you go and sign up for the Patreon at tinyurl.com backslash dcast Patreon. Nice little four or five minute rant at the end of the ninth episode covering that particular aspect of this case. With all of that being said, at this point, I am going to close the crypt for this week. I hope you have enjoyed the show. Till next time, the Deathcast is a production of Corpse Creep Publishing in association with Big Pond Podcasting. Stay morbid.